Welcome to the Manga May Newscast. It's March 5th, 2020, and I'm your host, Mike Grecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Front Line. Today we speak with Shaw Selby, an engineer and technologist who founded Conservify, a conservation tech lab that uses open source technologies to empower local communities and solve some of the most pressing conservation challenges of our time. Selby is literally a rocket scientist who spent a decade building and launching satellites with Boeing. But these days he's helping deploy technologies like drones, sensor networks, smartphone apps, and acoustic monitoring buoys to stop illegal poaching, monitor protected areas, and protect biodiversity. On today's episode of the Manga Bay Newscast, Shaw Selby talks about his journey from rocket science to conservation science, the open source hardware and online platform he's developing called FieldKit, and the conservation tech he's most excited about. I'm going to be most excited to see someone do something that I never even imagined in my wildest dreams of field kit, you know, and that's, I think, like, giving people kind of the, the base tools for them to do that is, is, is an incredible thing. Um, from, like, a technology standpoint, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very fascinated by sensors and where people are going to take sensors and the other kind of sensing the technologies that will come out of that. But first, here's the top news. China has banned the trade and consumption of wild animals in the wake of the coronavirus outbreak that has claimed more than 2,700 lives and infected more than 81,000 people, most of them in China, according to the state-run Xinhua News Agency. A temporary ban on trade in wildlife announced in January was expected to continue until the epidemic was brought under control. However, with the spread of the disease caused by the virus, known as COVID-19, showing no signs of abating, a more comprehensive ban was passed on February 24th by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, which exercises legislative power in the country. The step lays the groundwork for a possible permanent ban on wildlife trade that would have to be enshrined in China's wildlife laws. If passed, a permanent ban would be a big boost in the global fight against the illegal wildlife trade, since China is a major destination for trafficked animals. Conservationists say they believe such a move by China could be a big boost in the fight against the illegal wildlife trade, but also called for better enforcement of current laws. Fueled by searing temperatures and high winds, the Brazilian Pantanal was hit by unprecedented fires that engulfed at least 2.4 million hectares across the region in October and November 2019. Then, in January, just two months after the first bout and during what is supposed to be the rainy season, fires erupted once again. Both times, fires invaded well into Pantanal Mato Grossense National Park. Stretching 210,000 square kilometers across Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay, the Pantanal is the world's largest tropical wetland. In Brazil, it stretches across the states of Mato Grosso and Mato Grosso do Sul. The Pantanal is home to many different species of plants and animals, some of them threatened with extinction. Local sources say the fires were primarily the result of burning by farmers that spread out of control over an El Nino dried landscape. Firefighters were caught largely unprepared for the unseasonal fires as the state normally disassembles its response forces in December and enters a phase of planning for the next fire season. After burning for over a month, the fires were extinguished when rains finally fell in mid-February. And lastly, images of wild western lowland gorillas have been captured by camera traps deep in the jungles of central mainland Equatorial Guinea, marking the first time that the region's gorillas have been caught on film in more than a decade. Camera traps, deployed by conservationists with the Bristol Zoological Society and the University of West England, took the photos in Monte Allen National Park, which is located in central Rio Muni, the mainland region of Equatorial Guinea. Local communities had reported gorilla sightings in the region, but conservationists hadn't seen the animals for themselves until now. The photographs taken in the national park are significant because they confirm the gorilla's continued existence despite heavy hunting pressure. Particularly exciting, conservationists noted, is the fact that young gorillas estimated to be about four years old can be seen in the photos. In other words, there's a new generation of Equatorial Guinea's western lowland gorilla population, and it appears to be doing well. You can read more about all of today's top news items at mongabay.com. And if you'd like to request email alerts when we publish news stories on the topics you care about most, visit alerts.mongabay.com and sign up. Shaw Selby is a National Geographic Explorer and Fellow in addition to being the founder of Conservify, which he describes as the first conservation technology makerspace and nonprofit prototyping lab dedicated solely to conservation. Conservify builds on open source technologies to help scientists and conservationists do field work. Stuff like sensor arrays that monitor ecosystems and wildlife and provide real-time alerts via a smartphone app. The lab's main project is FieldKit, an open source platform due to be released widely next month that uses environmental sensors, 
a smartphone app, and the fieldkit.org website to give people and organizations the ability to collect and share field-based research data and tell stories through interactive visualizations. What's interesting is that while all these technologies are aimed at protecting life here on Earth, Selby actually began his career as a rocket scientist, working as a satellite engineer and building propulsion systems to help spacecraft escape the tiny blue marble we call home. I really love working on space stuff and, and satellites in general. Um, it, was, it was a great job. It, it allowed me to really kind of explore my engineering side quite deeply, but also have the opportunity to do things like work mission controls and launches. Um, so so it, was, it was something that I, I quite enjoyed. But, but fundamentally, I've always kind of believed that engineering could play a, like a larger role in solving some of humanity's greatest challenges. You know, it always has, right? Like engineers were a big part of, you know, creating better health systems that helped us solve diseases or explore the world and, and space and all these different things. And, you know, when it comes down to most jobs in the space sector, they tend to be driven by, you know, uh, commercial interests, right? So communication, satellites, and things like that. Well, I did have the opportunity to work on some weather satellites and, and, and NASA sort of projects. Uh, the majority of what I was doing was, was basically helping satellite communication companies make a lot more money, you know? Um, and, and so I, I had always really kind of looked for something beyond that, ways that I could use my skill set as, as an engineer to try and answer some questions that were, were out there in the world. Um, and that, that originally led me through working with organizations like Engineers Without Borders for a number of years, doing a lot of work around kind of post-disaster rebuilding efforts and things like that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was always kind of like looking to see if I could find a place where I could maybe have more of a of a role in helping solve some problems. And it was when I went back to grad school um, where I really started to kind of be exposed to these sorts of things. I, I was um, going to school in, in for engineering um, up at Stanford and ended up just by chance working with an organization based out of there called the Center for Ocean Solutions. Um, and they were looking at, at a whole bunch of different big ocean issues that were happening. But one of the ones that really stood out to me, and this was like back in the 2007 timeframe, was, was, uh, was the issue of illegal fishing and kind of how things happened out at the open seas. And it resonated with me because, you know what, I, I love the oceans. I was a scuba diver. Um, I spent a lot of time kind of enjoying the things that come out of the sea, including seafood. Uh, and, and it made me, made me kind of realize that, that what was happening behind the scenes was, was a lot more complicated and had a lot more issues behind it than I, than I had actually known before. Um, and so I, st I started on a project with them, an in independent grad research project around how maybe, you know, I can incorporate my engineering skills into trying to find some solutions around that. And that's kind of where my journey into conservation technology first got started. Selby found that as a former rocket scientist, he could bring a unique perspective to the conservation challenges we face and how to help solve those challenges through technology. At that time, I definitely brought in a, a lot of unique perspectives perspectives as an engineer, as somebody who understood technology. Um, I, I recall some of those those early meetings I had with a lot of the folks in those days, uh, you know, where the, I'd be in a room full of environmental lawyers and conservation biologists and stuff talking about these issues, and I would be the, the, the only engineer in the room, right? And, and when I would bring up, well, there's maybe a better way to do this, or have you looked at how these people are solving this problem? Um, in the beginning, it was it was like there was quite a bit of skepticism about about it. Like, uh, you know, what is actually the role that can actually, that technology can play in conservation? How can it fit into this? And and um, th there's in those early days, it seemed to be a lot of kind of convincing people that like maybe these things could be used in a way that that um, kind of makes more sense. And I, I would say like the perfect example of that would be some of the early work that I did with with drones. Um, using drones for conservation purposes. So, you know, I started through that Stanford program, I started thinking a lot about how you can custom build these drones that could go and do coastal monitoring of these places. And, you know, back then, this was like a pre-DJI time where like consumer grade drones were just not easy to come by. So when you use the word drone, most people immediately thought about, you know, the wars that were happening in the Middle East or like, you know, military 
multi-million dollar big drones. And and so it was really, it, at that point, it seemed like it was like a, you know, I was almost you know, using a bad word when I was saying that in those sorts of circles, you know. And nowadays we see, you know, just fantastic work that people all across the world are doing with drones for conservation. So it was, it was like, it's been interesting to see how that, that has changed over the years as we moved uh, into the future. After his experience with ocean conservation, Selby founded Conservify in 2015. So the way that it actually happened, it's 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 a lot and thanks to the National Geographic Society. So um, after Stanford, I was doing a lot of work with with foundations or NGOs or, or other groups, just kind of helping them think through the role of technology in, in their projects. Um, but it but it did definitely have like a mostly ocean conservation uh, lens to the work that I was doing at that point. Um, in in 2013, I was picked as one of uh, Nat Geo's emerging explorers, and coming to the Explorer Symposium, talking to other people who are working on conservation issues outside of the ocean space, I started to see that same opportunity that I that I saw in those early days when I was when I was talking to the folks at the Center for Ocean Solutions in other areas. And 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 ultimately in those relationships started branching out to do more terrestrial work as well. Part of that too was the fact that, you know, like when it comes to technology, when you look at things terrestrially, uh, everything is easier than doing stuff in the ocean, right? You don't have to worry about salt water. You have land basically everywhere that things can sit on, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's communications in lots of places. It's just a lot of the challenges that you have to work through when you're trying to build something that's going to live in an ocean environment. You just don't have to worry about when it happens uh, terrestrially. Um, and so that's when I first started kind of working in that space as well. Um, and, and, you know, over a number of years, worked on a bunch of projects. In 2016, I became a fellow at the National Geographic Society, focusing on this idea of conservation technology and how we can push it forward. Um, and as part of that, uh, decided, you know, I wanted to start a lab that was focused, you know, exclusively on building technology, open source technologies, just solely for conservation projects. Um, and that's when I started Conservify with support from National Geographic. Um, to, to actually do that and, and get it off the ground. And so the, the idea was let's, let's build this, you know, tech prototyping lab, something similar to what you would find in places like Silicon Valley uh, that are focused usually on building products, consumer products, things like that. But, you know, every single project that comes in the door will have some sort of environmental or conservation thing around it. Um, and then every piece of technology that we create, whether it's hardware, software, apps, whatever that be, um, it will be completely open source. So as soon as we're done developing it, we'll put all the designs and everything online for anybody who wants to go and you know take it and remix it and hack it and figure out how it can be something of their own. And and the idea behind that is like, you know, we we really wanted to help build capacity across the conservation technology community and just make this stuff easier for everybody to do. Conservify has developed a number of technologies that are being put to use in the field right now. It seems like the technologies we've worked on have typically fallen into a couple of buckets. One, it's it's um, some sort of sensor-based technology. Two, is uh, it's something drone-related, um, or or the third, it's something that has to do with apps and software. Um, but you know, one example of, of of an ongoing project we've had running for the last three years was um, was this uh, Bow Glacier project that we work on, and so that was a, a project that actually came to us through through an artist group that was actually got some public art funding and they wanted to build some art based off of real scientific data. And they came to us to actually build sensors that can monitor um, the Bow Glacier in Banff, Nas in Banff National Park and bring back that data live. That data will go to you know a glaciologist that's using that data to actually study the glacier, but at the same time, it'll also be streamed live to a public art installation that they're building in the middle of downtown Calgary, um, which is like kind of a cool project some, because we don't usually work on things that are art related. And you know usually our funding comes from buckets that are conservation focused uh, buckets, but this time it was slightly different. And so that project's actually been going on for the last three years. We've had, we have this, you know, these seismic sensors around this glacier that we've been monitoring the activity of the glacier and how it melts in three-dimensional space, um, and then sending that data back. So 
it's actually, if you want to see the results of that, if you're ever in, in downtown Calgary, um, if you go to the foot of the tallest building in Calgary, which is Brookfield Place, you, there's, a, there's a park that's kind of designed after that glacier. And the lights and the sounds that are transmitted to that park um, are actual real seismic, live seismic activity that's happening at that glacier that comes from these open source sensors that we built at Conservify and deployed um, in Banff. Last year, Conservify won the Hackaday Prize, a global hardware design contest for FieldKit, what's become the lab's flagship product. FieldKit was actually born out of some work that we had been doing um, earlier in, in Botswana in the Okavango Delta. So, you know, we, we came into this space wanting to like uh, build hardware that could help monitor like changing ecosystems. Um, and when you look at the sensor landscape, even till today, you know, there, it's, it's typically broken up into two extremes. On one side, you have these um, very accurate, super expensive scientific sensors that when you talk to the field science community, they're, you know, they're the ones that they always want to use. They're, uh, they're, they're robust, very well engineered, but completely inaccessible to all but the most well-funded scientists. You know, these things cost in the thousands to tens of thousands for, for a unit. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you had, you know, kind of what we were originally doing in the Okavango, which, which was like, how do we take these like very accessible tools, things like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, and we try and like put together a system that can rival these very expensive counterparts. Raspberry Pi and Arduino are both open source computing and electronics platforms. And, you know, through that process, we ran into all sorts of kind of issues that you would you would run into as you're trying to hack together something um, from from different components um, and, and all the headaches that you would run into for all that. And it was kind of through that work that um, this this uh, the other person who the other half of field kit uh, early on was this individual named Jer Thorpe, who's uh, like a very talented uh, data artist and has done like a lot of work around open data and sharing data and, and things like that. And so we came together to think like, OK, so what happens if we were to actually try and build, uh, you know, our own type of environmental sensing hardware that really like stands true to the stuff that you would see Arduino and a lot of the open hardware doing, but at the same time can give you scientifically relevant data that the that the kind of the established companies are providing. Um, there was this big hole in the middle of that market that we saw could potentially be filled. Um, the, the other thing that we wanted to do was give people, you know, a lot of options and modularity about building these sorts of things. So anybody who's deployed kind of traditional sensors in the field knows that it's very difficult to integrate two different types of sensors or, or, or like, you know, bring that sensor data back live over cellular or something. I mean, you have to buy these big expensive units and the whole thing just ends up becoming very, very complex. So we started thinking like, how do we, if we wanted to design a new way to do this, how do we do it from the ground up that's low cost, super modular, and accessible for a lot of people. And that's kind of where FieldKit came out. That's what the, the idea of FieldKit was born from that sort of work. There are several FieldKit pilot projects already underway, but it gets a much wider release next month around Earth Day. We've been working on FieldKit, you know, for the last couple years, but but very, very seriously working on it as like our, our biggest project over the last like year and a half. Over that, that time we've been working on it, we've been We've been uh, de deploying it with partners. So we work with you know, the WCS and Florida International University of the Amazon. We work at UCLA in, in, in the Congo Basin. Um, and, and so we've been like putting these things out and testing them and making sure that they work the way that they, we want them to work. But you know, our plan on Earth Day and kind of in celebration of the 50th, 50th anniversary of Earth Day is actually to make it available to anybody who wants to use it. And, and when I say anybody, I mean, you know, not only field scientists or universities or, or you know, conservation NGOs, but um, high school students or citizen scientists or, you know, environmental justice act act activists, people who, who can actually find interesting uses, uh, relevant uses and kind of important uses around uh, around environmental data if it's just a lot more accessible for you to do that. You know, we're, we're very interested in, in kind of the new questions that are going to emerge when you can do this stuff reliably and scientifically accurately, but do it for cheap. Um, and so that's kind of the, uh, 
starting Earth Day, we're just gonna put it out there. And anybody wants to come and get it, they wanna build it, they wanna do whatever they want, it's all there for them to use. Field Kit utilizes tech like sensor modules and satellite data and smartphone apps, but it also provides data visualization capabilities. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, so basically it's it's three main things, right? So one is is these sensors, this hardware that I've been talking about. Um, and so what we what we've been designing in that space is you know like data loggers, uh, uh, different sensor modules. So right now we have have sensors that we've designed to measure things like pH and conductivity and dissolved oxygen, and other water quality parameters. We've designed it, uh, a low cost weather station. Um, we're working on air quality parameters and seismic recordings and all sorts of stuff, right? So we have all these sensor modules and like all these different boards that we've been decide designing in that place and an enclosure that you could put it all within and it supports things like solar power and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's got, it's, it's quite um, ex extendable in terms of adding on different things and you can bring back data from, you know, using LoRaWAN or satellite or cellular, all these different other technologies that people um, like using quite a bit. The the second piece that we've we've designed with FieldKit is is a is a mobile app, you know, iOS and Android app. The reason why we did that is because, you know, the app world is really kind of the easiest accessibility tool we have to get out to the greatest audiences. And so we wanted to be, allow, give people a way to download data off their devices, configure their sensors, do all sorts of stuff through an app so they don't actually have to go in and code anything, you know? So, so we've, we've, you know, did a big uh, U, U, UI, UX, user interface, user experience effort around uh, FieldKit in general and like how regular people would be able to use this stuff and, and do so. And then built a lot of that stuff into the app. The other thing that we built into the app that's kind of unique is that, you know, when people put sensors out into the field, there's a whole bunch of metadata around how they're deploying it, other data that they collect ab about those deployments that when you go back and you look at that data later on, it, it, it matters to other people who are reviewing that data, you know? So like one example of this is, you know, uh, how would you know that someone's deploying a, you know, their water quality sensor in, uh, you know, in the place that they're actually saying they're deploying it or, or like just putting it in their aquarium or in their, their toilet at home, you know? So, so there's a bunch of metadata around like, how do you like do actually deploy these things that is important to the actual data that's on the device itself. So we built that into the deployment process on the app. So, so it kind of guides people through how to deploy these things and gather that data. And then that, all that metadata is attached to every single science, you know, sensor reading that comes out of that, that device. Um, and then the last bit that we've built is fieldkit.org. Um, so fieldkit.org has a, a logged in portal that people can explore the data visualization and kind of be able to share it and analyze their data um, and, and then export it into things like Jupyter Notebooks or, or CSVs or whatever else you want to kind of export that stuff into. Um, and, and then the, the data visualization side is like, we've really gotten a lot out of working with Jer on this. That's Canadian data artist and field kit data lead, Jer Thorpe. Jer has been kind of the leader in terms of helping us think through what that looks because that's the space he works in is data viz. Um, so there's a lot of really cool stuff we're doing on the on the website side. But the, the idea is you could go out, you take these sensors out, you could put whatever modules on there, whatever configuration you wanna do, you put it all in, you put that stuff out into the world and, and and you just have it run off a of solar or run off a of battery and just collect all that data. And, uh, and eventually that data ends up in the portal and you can do whatever you want with it. Between the focus on open source technologies and data visualization, there's definitely a theme emerging, accessibility. I think for us, you know, we're, we're very excited about getting these tools into the hands of people who just right now, like, cannot afford the, the current tools that are out there. So, you know, through like our pilot projects and, and some of the work that Conservify has done in the past, we work a lot with kind of uh, indigenous communities or scientists that are on the ground in some of these uh, very high biodiversity areas. And they really struggle to be able to kind of afford uh, the types of tools that are out there. So, so first and foremost, like I'm excited to get FieldKit into the hands of these sorts of people because um, these are things that ca that can definitely fit in with within their grant budgets, or can be you know sourced from philanthropically, and and you can kind of get those um, into the hands of those people. That's who we we worked with most frequently. Um, but I but I think that there's there's you know we we sent out a survey to see what people wanted from FieldKit, and we got a, 
a lot of responses, way more responses than we expected to get about this, which showed kind of the excitement around this idea. And there was a lot of people in the educa education space that were really excited about using this to teach students about climate change and some of the other things that are happening in the world. There's a huge community of citizen scientists that I think that are um, going to be excited about this. We're you know at a low enough price point that we can kind of reach that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really eager to see the uses that come out of this from an environmental justice perspective, because I think that there, there's a lot more you can tell um, when that sort of stuff's happening. I mean, we, you know, I, I live in Los Angeles and we had this big uh, gas leak that happened at Porter Ranch. The Porter Ranch gas blowout, also known as the Aliso Canyon gas leak, was a massive natural gas leak in 2015 widely considered to have been the worst gas leak in U.S. history due to its environmental impact. Um, and, and that stuff was basically invisible and nobody really had the tools to, to monitor the levels in those places, you know, because these sorts of things weren't cheap and available to a lot of, a lot of people. Um, so I'm really, really, really curious to see what comes out of that. Um, but, but right now we're, we're mostly working with, with universities and NGOs. So the, the, the projects that we've been deploying on is uh, the biggest one and kind of the longest running one was uh, WCS has this project that's called Citizen Science for the Amazon. Um, and it's and it's focus. It's it's a lot of collaborators. It's all the WCS off offices in the Amazon uh, basin. Uh, universities like Florida International University and Cornell are involved in this effort as well. And, and the idea is to really understand how the Amazon basin is changing both from like a water perspective and a, and a fish perspective, migrations and, and things like that. And so we, we actually built the water quality stations, the weather stations, the water level stations uh, that are deployed there as part of that project on their, their field kit stations. And, and we're returning this year to kind of replace all those with the newest and shiniest hardware we've created and, and expand the project out um, even further. Uh, we've we've also been working with UCLA. UCLA is is a part of this uh, group in the Congo Basin called the Congo Basin Institute that's looking at a number of, of field stations in in Congo. And their their like biggest one is in in the Jaw Reserve in Cameroon. And so we traveled to the Jaw uh, last December and deployed a bunch of field kit stations there, and also built a Lorawan radio network, like an open network, so that if anybody in that region who actually wants to bring back data through that network, they're able to do that. Uh, and, so, and you know, there's other projects that we work on. So American Prairie Reserve is another one where we're deploying field kit stations and also this lower one uh, network um, as well. And then this next year, we have some big projects coming forward. We're, we're um, partnering with adventure scientists to do monitoring of 11,000 mile, miles of the wild and scenic rivers within the US. And they're gonna use field kit water stations to monitor all those through the volunteer network that they're working on there. Um, there's lots of, lots of great partnerships we've formed in the past with people who knew that you know, we were developing a new technology and sometimes that, that means that some things are not gonna work or we're gonna have failures here and there. And they're all very understanding of that, which has been absolutely fantastic as we kind of get to this point by Earth Day where we're where we have something that we believe is stable and useful and, and, and kind of be, can be sent out to the world. As is probably obvious by now, Selby is just excited in general about the future of conservation technology. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much I'm excited about. I mean, I would, I would say the, the, the thing I'm most excited about, just broadly about the conservation technology industry, isn't a specific technology, but it's the excitement around this field that we see nowadays. I mean, we, we have engineers from Microsoft and Google and all these sorts of places that are now actively contributing to conservation technology projects, you know, because they're just they're just inspired by them. And like and, and like the accessibility of these tools that have come out, things like AudioMoth have just been amazing that someone could build something that used to cost thousands of dollars. And now there's this thing that costs 40 bucks and can actually do the same sort of stuff on it. Like I'm most excited to see these ideas that are coming out of people. And it's, and it's kind of why we're building a uh, field kit to be very modulars because I don't, you know, I'm going to be most excited to see someone do something that I never even imagined in my wildest dreams of field kit, you know, and that's, I think like giving people kind of the, the base tools for them to do that is, is, is an incredible thing. Um, from like a technology standpoint, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very fascinated by sensors and where people are going to take sensors and the other kind of sensing that 
technologies that will come out of that, things like eDNA. That's environmental DNA, which is genetic materials left in the environment by organisms. Ways that you can integrate like machine learning on, onto these devices so that you can, you can look at acoustic signals coming out of the rainforest or you can look at camera trap data that's coming out and actually um, pull some interesting insight out of those. I think that's going to be a hugely beneficial thing. Um, just broadly, since you know I've worked on drones for so long, I'm very excited to see the things that people are doing with drones nowadays. And you know th that technology is like very much limited on our ability to fly them long distances. It's battery technology that's holding that back. But once once that's kind of like broken, once that's solved, I think we're you're gonna just going to see some people doing some really really amazing and powerful work with that. So where does Shaw Selby see conservation technology five years from now? I, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I hope to see more programs at, at universities that are actually like working with students in these fields, both like in the fields of, you know, ecology and biology and conservation, but also in, in engineering schools to allow people to, to, to even realize that this is an option for them to work on these sorts of things. I wish I knew that it was an option early on. I would have gone right into it, you know, and it, and it wasn't really that in the past. I, you know, I, I want to see more of these people who are working on conservation technology solutions collaborating uh, with each other more and like building kind of better systems. I think broadly as a conservation tech community, like we collaborate pretty well and every single project at Conservify is a collaboration between us and someone else. Um, and I think that like we're really only going to solve some of these really critical issues that we're facing, things like climate change and you know, extinction of, of very, very critical animals and, you know, food security and all this stuff that we're seeing that is very, very much related to uh, conservation. The only way we can solve it is if we kind of band together and create these better systems instead of competing on who can build the better widget. I think that's a big thing. And I, and I, I see that happening in the conservation technology space and I get very excited just about it. Check out Conservify at conservify.org. And if you're ready to start collecting field data yourself, go to fieldkit.org. If you enjoy the Mangabe Newscast, we ask that you please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Just a dollar per month will really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please support the Mangabe Newscast at patreon.com slash That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash and don't forget you can subscribe to the Manga Bay Newscast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, TuneIn, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And of course you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash mangabay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at mangabay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host Mike Gorecki signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.